Major breaking news, the United States Supreme Court heard argument today over whether or not 300 individuals charged with crimes associated with January 6th, including President Trump, whether or not they can be charged with felonies for obstructing an official proceeding. I explained to you this was a stretch before, and it turns out it looks like the United States Supreme Court is going to agree with me and toss out all of these felony charges against President Trump and these January 6th protesters. Stay tuned, we're gonna break down this oral argument in Fisher versus the United States in one moment. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of many books, including Disarm, what the Ukraine War teaches Americans about the right to bear arms. All right, major breaking news here. The U.S. Supreme Court heard oral argument today in the United States versus Fisher case. This arose out of the January 6th protest in Washington, D.C. Bear in mind that what this case involves is there is a federal statute, 18 U.S.C., 18 U.S.C., 1512C, that deals with obstruction or tampering with official processes. Specifically, the title of this code is tampering with a witness, victim, or an informant. Now, the relevant part of this law arose after there was document destruction and alleged witness tampering in the context of various financial, financial Wall Street-related fraud crimes, such as the Enron scandal. That's when this law came into being. It was really about destroying evidence when you're been charged with a crime or when there's an investigation of whether or not you've committed a crime or you're involved with some sort of a civil lawsuit. This is what the idea was about. This is how it was always interpreted and applied by the United States Department of Justice until, until January 6, 2021, when the Department of Justice realized that many of their charges against the January 6 protesters uh, were not very strong and none of them were felonies or very few of them were felonies. Most of them were just BS misdemeanors like trespass or being in the wrong area at the wrong time kind of stuff. Um, most of which would never cause a person to even pay attention to this. If you're a serious prosecutor doing the work of the justice system uh, in an earnest way. Nevertheless, in order to elevate a lot of these charges to felonies, the Department of Justice invented an interpretation of this relevant part of the statute of 18 U.S.C. 1512c, specifically arguing that one kind of reference uh, about otherwise interfering with an official proceeding, that somehow the January 6 protesters had corruptly, that was the argument, they corruptly interfered with the confirmation and the counting of the electoral votes on January 6, 2021, and therefore they were charged with felonies. And this is a big deal because a lot of these individuals went from being charged with misdemeanors, which are kind of like in the grand scheme of things meaningless, uh, to being charged with felonies where they could literally go to jail for like 10 years or more. So this case of United States versus Fisher went to the US Supreme Court, and I wanna remind you one critical thing, that President Trump, the main charges, the main, if I were a lawyer for President Trump, which I'm not, but if I were, the main problem or the concern I would have representing President Trump in the January 6th indictments by the special prosecutor Jack Smith hired to go after Donald Trump, my best or my concern would be that these felony charges against Donald Trump for corruptly obstructing the proceedings on Capitol Hill on January 6th under 18 U.S.C. 1512C would be the biggest potential problem because they are felonies with long prison sentences. Well, the Supreme Court granted this case, uh, granted cert in this case of Fisher, and it's pretty clear if you listen to the oral argument, I'll play some of it for you in future videos, it's pretty clear that the Supreme Court is not going to let the Department of Justice invent out of whole cloth an interpretation of the statute that somehow goes from penalizing people that are destroying documents or tampering with witnesses in the context of a very specific legal case to anyone that somehow gets in the way of a congressional event. What's very interesting is Justice Barrett, for example, really raised an interesting question. She says, well, it seems to me, Department of Justice, under your interpretation of corruptly obstructing an official proceeding, arguably a lobbyist who's tried to alter uh, legislation or uh, whether or not something's passed or not, she's like, it seems to me that a lobbyist can conceivably be charged with this crime. And that yes, they might have a First Amendment defense 
a right to petition the government? Possibly, but that would be a defense. You could still charge them. So Justice Barrett thought that the way the interpret the way uh, the Department of Justice was interpreting the statute was so overly broad, it might even cause lobbyists to be indicted. And specifically, the critical language here, and this is this is important for Justice Roberts because it's even Justice Roberts appeared very skeptical of the DOJ position and interpretation. And of course, if Justice Roberts and it looks like Kavanaugh and Barrett go along with what appears to be based on the questioning, a confirmed votes for Thomas Alito and Gorsuch, you'll have a, at least at least a 63 victory uh, in favor of knocking out these felony charges against President Trump and uh, over 300 of these January 6 protesters. Specifically, just as a reminder, the relevant statute talks about the destruction of documents and tampering witness, but then it has a catch-all clause at the very end that reads as follows, that says that a person that otherwise, otherwise obstructs influences or impedes any official proceeding or attempts to do so. You hear what I just said? The phrase, and this is the key, because I'm going to explain to you why this basically means that we're going to win Justice Roberts on this argument. The phrase in the statute goes that some, someone who, quote, otherwise obstructs, influences, or impedes an official proceeding. Now, now, Justice Roberts basically tipped his hand here when he said that uh, he asked about the doctrine of estudum uh, generis. Estudum generis. Okay, I'm not the best Latin pronunci pronouncer, but you get the point. What this doctrine really is, is when you have a, in a sentence, okay, I'm going to make it easy for you. In a sentence, if at the start of a sentence, you have a list of specific types of items, and then the sentence ends with some sort of catch-all phrase like, or otherwise, or otherwise, or other things, that word other things or otherwise cannot be construed as anything else in the universe. It's modified by the category or types of items that precede it in a sentence. So the example I like to give for is if I say you're not allowed to go to a baseball game, to a hockey game, to a football game, to a basketball game, or otherwise. Now, the Department of Justice would interpret that, at least the way they're doing it in the Fisher case, is the phrase, or otherwise, means that you're not allowed to do anything in the world because or otherwise just expands. But under this doctrine that Justice Roberts brought up, the words or otherwise would have to be modified and narrowed to be consistent with the rest of the sentence. And because the example I just gave you all involves a going to a sporting event, the phrase or otherwise at the end of that sentence would have to be limited to at most another sporting event because the otherwise is modified by the types of objects or the types of items referenced in the prior sentence. And here in the context of this January 6th case, because the entire statute clearly involves tampering with witnesses, destroying documents in the context of some sort of a litigation, whether it be a criminal case or a civil case, a grand jury case, grand jury investigation, right? Some sort of a legal process. The fact that the end of the statute, it says, or otherwise, or otherwise obstructs some sort of official proceeding cannot be interpreted to mean any official proceeding, including, let's say, the counting of electoral count votes or electoral votes on January 6, 2021. So it's pretty clear the Supreme Court thought that the interpretation by DOJ was way overbroad and violated a whole host of statutory canons. And I think that's right. All right, folks, so there you have it. I think this is going to be a big win for President Trump and the January 6 protesters. Uh, it looks like these felony charges are going to get thrown out in over 300 cases. Uh, it's terrible that the Department of Justice decided to go down this path and invent something up. In fact, this was brought up during the oral argument. Some of the justices specifically said, you know, before January 6, had this statute ever been applied outside of the context of a, a legal case. And basically the Department of Justice says no, but they thought that January 6th was such a unique circumstance, it warranted this application. But it's pretty clear the US Supreme Court is going to slam the door shut on this DOJ argument, and it's gonna wipe out, I don't know, over half of the Donald Trump indictment, among other things. So we'll see what this means, but the bottom line is it looks very good um, if you're a defendant in the January 6th or President Trump. It looks like the Supreme Court is gonna make the Department of Justice do its job. Um, um, against its will, and that's where we stand. So don't forget to follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner. Uh, hope you learned something, and don't forget to subscribe. And we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table two A.